Welcome to the Indie Film NYC podcast, where we help filmmakers merge the art and business of independent filmmaking. I'm your host, John Fallon. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode number six of the Indie Film NYC podcast. It could be argued that no film would exist if a writer somewhere didn't sit down and hammer out the screenplay to get it all started. To that end, I thought I would bring in a screenwriter who is actively writing scripts and getting films produced so he can talk about the process of getting something that's just an idea in someone's head all the way until it's an actual movie that anyone could watch. I had the good fortune of connecting with Bob Sainz through a Facebook screenwriting group. I noticed Bob because he would generously share his knowledge and experience with anyone who had legitimate questions about how the industry works. So after doing some research on his work and reading his blog, I struck up a conversation and shared with him what I am trying to do with the Indie Film NYC podcast. Being that he likes to impart knowledge to up-and-coming filmmakers and screenwriters, Bob agreed to talk with me and to give his no-nonsense views of the industry to the Indie Film NYC audience. There are many paths a filmmaker can take. And typically, I like to keep the focus on indie films instead of talking about working in the studio system. But there is a lot of blurring of lines when it comes to screenwriting, because it's the one thing that doesn't change. Whether there is no budget at all, or $200 million behind a production, a feature film is still approximately 120, 8.5 by 11 pages of screenplay. Bob's story is both practical and inspirational, because he started by focusing on writing and taking the time to learn the craft. Then he took advantage of opportunities to further his career. I feel that a lot of filmmakers, especially writer-directors, want to bust out of the gate with their first film and be seen as the next great auteur. And that's a great place to aspire to if that's the goal you've set for yourself, but there's something to be said for taking advantage of the opportunities in front of you and producing the best work you're capable of. A thread that weaves through all of Bob's story is that of course you have to have a level of talent and professionalism. But the skill that will truly move you closer to where you want to be is the ability to build relationships that last. A testament to that idea is that a couple of weeks after my conversation with Bob, a film that he wrote about 18 years ago went into production with big name talent and should be hitting the screen in the next year. While neither of us are at liberty to disclose any details at this time, Bob does go into great detail about the script, how it got him attention for his writing, and playing the long game. I hope you all get as much out of this interview as I did with talking with Bob Saints. Tell me who you are and uh, why right, I'm talking to you today. Uh, I'm Bob Saints. I'm a writer now. I, I sometimes act. Um, I'm starting to put on producer shoes. Um, we'll see what happens there. Um, I, um, I didn't start this career till I was 40. I was doing something else um, in the business world, and uh, it's been an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, trip. I um, uh, this year, 2016, I have two movies that shoot one in one starts June 21st, the one you read. Mm-hmm. One starts July 10th or so, and then I have a pilot for a series I sold that shoots in October. I just sold a script on a pitch. The other script I sold on a pitch supposedly shoots this year, but I'm not sure. It's a Christmas movie. Um, And uh, in addition to the other two, and I don't know what else. I've got a few other option things out there and a few other other possibilities going right now. Cool. uh, So let's start with the Christmas movie. Now, your early days of writing... Started with uh, the Hallmark Channel, is that right? Oh, no, no, no. My first produced film was a Hallmark Christmas film called Mm -hmm. Help for the Holidays. But that came after 18 years of not having a produced film and writing and writing and writing and writing and optioning all kinds of of scripts Mm -hmm. and never having them get made. Mm -hmm. And that's when I I realized that 90% of option scripts don't get made. Mm -hmm. And, And that was a big, like eye-opener for me so I um, I just struggled and struggled and finally I got and this was before I even had a manager finally in 2011 maybe late 2011 I got a manager off a recommendation from a director who really liked me and liked what I wrote 
And he got me in one of my first rooms, and one of my first rooms was one of the feeder production companies for Hallmark. And they, believe it or not, wanted to see me based on two scripts. One was Extracurricular Activity, which you read, mm -hmm. which is like the anti-Hallmark movie, which is why sure, I couldn't right. quite understand why they wanted to see me. <laughs> The other one was a script that I wrote with Jeff Willis, who is now an executive at Marvel. Okay. Um, and we wrote a script, a romantic comedy called The Right Girl, which wasn't right for them either because it was uh, um, almost an R-rated script and um, the way we wrote it. And at the end, the two protagonists don't get together. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, um, there's a relationship there, but it's not quite where it needs to be yet, and sure. in, for a good reason because of the way the story played out. Mm -hmm. And they love that script too, and they ended up buying that script from us and producing that script. And the product produced film looks nothing like the script we originally wrote. We could probably take that original script out, put a new name on it, and sell it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Is that different? It was so different, right. but. Jeff and I did all the rewrites on it, all of them. Oh, okay. And, and we agreed to whatever they wanted to change because we wanted to see it produced and we wanted to see our names on it only rather than have other writers be on it. Mm -hmm. So we were very cooperative and very happy, and it got produced and it did. Uh, it showed on ABC Family, I think, and um, a couple other places, and it's in, like, on... It's coming to... It's going to be on... on um, on uh, Netflix soon, and we're happy about it. And what's that called? It's called The Right Girl. The Right Girl. And th anyway, they, they liked the way I wrote, so they, they said, well, we have this script that we have, a uh, Christmas script, called Help for the Holidays, and we'd like you to read it. And I said I'd be happy to read it and to see what you think. And I read it, and then they asked me what I thought, and I said, what, what would help it, and I said a blowtorch. <laughs> um, that it was awful. And I don't know, I was really kind of concerned at why they even were, would have bought it. And they said, well, the, the, the skeleton of the story is, is cool. And we like the skeleton of the story, but what if the main character, instead of being this pushy, nosy person, was, was an elf working for Santa? And I said, nah, oh, you got something going. Mm -hmm. I said, that's a really good idea. And they said, okay. We'll pay you this much money, and I went, wow, to uh, do a page one rewrite and make her an elf, and you can do anything you want as long as you stay within the lines of our brand. And Hallmark has a brand, and they have actual rules about what their characters can and can't do, what kind of situations they can and can't be in. Mm -hmm. And I understand it because, you know, every good, um, every good, network or production company has their brand and, and you and as a writer you need to understand that brand and be willing to work within that brand so I said okay so I wrote the I wrote the script and they loved it and there were I skirted their brand a little at times and they said for a couple of the jokes those are really funny we can't do that <laughs> and I said okay but they left a lot of things that I thought they would take out um, it ended up starring Summer Glau, and uh, it was the number one rated Hallmark film for 2012. I think it was the number one rated cable film for 2012. It was the seventh highest rated Hallmark movie of all time, and it kind of cemented me as um, a go-to guy for Hallmark and their feeder production companies. When my original scripts are all very dark... Mm -hmm. And kind of twisted, and just a little bit. <laughs> um, it was just a really interesting turn of events for my writing career. But it's paid off. I mean, the Hallmark, all those Hallmark movies, and now there are eight of them. All those Hallmark movies on my my resume have helped me get into other rooms with other TV networks and other other cable people and other production companies because they see that I have a they they look at the, the 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 body of work and say okay these companies must trust this guy because they keep bringing him back right and now is this new Christmas movie is that also for the Hallmark Channel 
Yeah, it is. It's one of their feeder production companies, and they asked me, it's a long, involved story, sure. they asked me if I had any ideas for Christmas movie, and I said, yeah, I do, I have one weird one, and they said, well, we'd like to hear the weird one, and <laughs> I, I, I gave it to them, it's called Christmas in Joytown, and it's nothing like what you think, and uh, they actually really, really liked it, so... Um, so uh, that's what happened. So we'll see. I uh, it's a long, involved story. I pitched it without having a script. Okay. And they loved it. And then they said, "Look, you're doing this and this for us, which was some, which are some other projects. And we have these two writers that we owe a make good to. Do you know what a make good is?" Uh, Where you screw but... writers out of a job somehow mm -hmm. that you promised them, and they say we'll make it good in the future. So they said we have two writers we have to make good with. We're, how about we buy the story from you and we let the, them write it? And I said you're going to buy a story from me that I haven't written. And I said, well, how much would you buy the story for? And they told me, and I said sold. <laughs> so I'll get a story by credit. Sure. And I wrote, it took me, what, 45 minutes to write one page synopsis. synopsis yeah. Nice. And I got a four figure payout for it. <laughs> Very nice. It's uh, capitalism at its finest, right? Yeah, I guess. I mean, it just it worked. So, yeah, no. That's... So, so the, the, and I said, uh, I said to them, but none, they, the, but none the of that would have come around if you didn't have this relationship with them. Oh, I mean, absolutely not. No, no, and no. And no, I think no, that's no. the point of the sold, whole thing. I just walked into a production yeah. company a month ago um, with uh, with an actress actually oh. in tow, mm -hmm. who I knew that um, Hallmark wanted to put into a movie because she told me, and she's a friend. Sure. And I said. I have an idea for a film that would be perfect for you. And I said, and she goes, well, let's go in together. And I said, okay. So we walked in. She's a pretty, pretty famous, like TV actress okay. and young TV actress. Um, and, and, uh, we walked into the, to the place together and I got maybe two minutes into pitching this thing. And the head of the production company, who was an ex mogul, I think he was the head of Paramount or Sony or something. Mm -hmm looked at me and said, looked at his, his assistant and said, let's buy this. <laughs> and that was it. Great. Right, right. So I still have to write it, but I'm not going to write it without a contract, and I don't have a contract yet. So sure. those things take time. Yeah, of course. Now, that's uh, that's something maybe you can talk about a little bit. Uh, you know, a lot of people think, okay, I, I wrote the script. It's it's Tuesday, <laughs> right? I wrote the script. Should be. They bought it. They like it. We should be uh, ready to start going next next Monday, right? Let's talk about extracurricular activity. Sure, that's a, that's a great one. Okay. <laughs> um, I know you liked it. Yeah, I did. It was it was a great script. Uh, I mean, like you said, it was the it was the kind of script where I really wanted to know what was going to happen next. You know, I I wasn't sure where it was going. Well, nobody's sure where it's going, and it does go in some very strange directions. <laughs> Sure. It also should teach people, and it also it, it had and it has a protagonist that may not be a protagonist, and an antagonist that may not be an antagonist, mm -hmm. and it flutters back and forth between all of them, and nobody is really who they really pretend to be at times, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, guy who ends up being kind of the protagonist or the antagonist, because at the end you really don't know, uh, has no arc. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, I broke every story rule that is supposed to be a story for, you know, that you have to stick with Save the Cat, which I think is crap. You have to stick with Save the Cat and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. this is the most anti-Save the Cat script that ever existed. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's just nothing about it is, uh, is uh, formulaic in any way. And, and like you said, it, and it breaks all the rules. Let me tell you the history of the script. Okay. Ready? Yeah. I wrote it 18 years ago. It's getting filmed this year in this month in June. It's been optioned eight times by eight different production companies. And when was the first over option? Over the 18th year, over the 18 years. What, what year was the first option? Uh, I don't know, 18 years ago, whatever that is. I mean, yeah, I can. 98? 98. Huh? 98. 
98. Wow. Maybe okay. a year after I wrote it. Okay. <laughs> so, overnight. <laughs> long, overnight long term success. overnight success. Let me tell you what happens. <laughs> sure. The average that a film gets made from the time it's written, mm -hmm. do you know what it is? I don't know, actually. Eight years. Okay. That's how long it takes to get a movie made. I average. Sure. Now, the right girl. We broke. We broke. A, uh, we did a little better. It was like four and a half to five after we wrote it. It got made. Wow. Which is hey, that's really good. That's sure. really fast. Yeah. But the people who write these scripts think they're going to send them to Marvel or send them to <laughs> Disney or send them to to, to Warner Brothers. Yeah, whoever. And these guys are going to read it. They're going to pay me a. They're going to back a dump truck up to my house and empty money onto my my driveway. <laughs> And then they're gonna make this movie, and I'll be walking the red carpet in six months. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. that's what I that's the feeling I get from people sometimes. Yes, and it's completely and absolutely utterly wrong. Can you explain maybe why that happened? Like, what what takes so long? What? Well, getting a movie a movie made, mm -hmm. any movie, and I'm not talking about the kind of movies where your friend has a camera and you guys go out and get extras uh, actors and. And, and do it yourself and have it done in, you know, four weeks. I'm not, that's not a movie. I'm talking about a movie that gets distributed, a movie that either shows on TV or on Netflix or, or on Redbox or wherever it ends up going. Mm -hmm. um, um, any movie that gets made is a miracle. Okay? It's an absolute miracle. Mm -hmm. And because of all the things that have to go right for a film to get made, and there's a million things that could, if one of them goes wrong... It's over. Sure. So, what I what I so that that and financing is is so tough. It's so unbelievably tough because even though you can make a better movie cheaper because you no longer have to worry about film, which was a huge expense. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and you no longer have to worry about effects being super expensive because every day the cost of effects goes down. Um, you still have to do your... Um, you still have to get people to pony up the money to make it. Mm -hmm. And it's a risky investment because uh, the law says that you have to tell investors up front, by the way, you can lose all your money. There's no guarantees. Sure. And... And so that makes it that makes it even tougher. I mean, you know, so so and and you can't make a movie for thirty thousand dollars and expect it to be a distributed film. I mean, name the last thirty thousand dollar movie that was a success. Right. Well, there's the, the mythical uh, Robert Rodriguez movie. Ah, Plus only nice seven thousand dollars, right? I had a nice talk with Robert Rodriguez one day. He, mm -hmm. he I, I once, I had a regular recurring role on a TV series for six years. And this TV series called Nash Bridges with Don Johnson and mm -hmm. Cheech Marin. And Robert Rodriguez was a guest one time, and and he was there, and I was there, and he was sitting, I think, on a sofa on the set, and I plopped down next to him and introduced myself and said, "I, I need to pick your brain," <laughs> and he said, "Hey, man, sure." And we talked about El Mariachi, and he did indeed. Sit, he did indeed shoot it for seven grand. Mm -hmm. He did indeed shoot it um, on. Uh, he did indeed finance it on two Mastercards. Mm -hmm. But what people don't know is that the company that bought it put another two hundred fifty thousand dollars into the post production. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, he did sell it. But you know what? How many years ago was that? Oh, that had to be ninety-six. Okay, you got you've got you've got his movie. Mm -hmm. You got Pie. You got the Blair Witch Project. Right. You've got Clerks. Mm -hmm. Um, can you think of any more? Off top, no, not off the top of my head. Okay, let's let's add two more. Let's add six. Let's okay. add two more that we couldn't think of. Sure. That's six in, uh, super low-budget films 20 in years. 25 years? 
Okay, how many super low budget films have been made in those 25 years? 100,000? Well, I think the estimates are 15,000 a year, something like that. They're some ridiculous number of uh, like 10 to 15,000 films made a year, low budget films. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, the exception rate is kind of low. Right. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean... You know, it's it getting a movie made is a miracle, and 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 the way you get your movies made right um, is is you can make them yourself. You can, but the chances of success are so low; it's unbelievable. You've got to do something amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, amazing or different or groundbreaking, uh, and and that just doesn't happen. I just think it's really, really hard. It's really hard. And so I never thought of doing anything myself. Um, I just wanted to work with production companies and see if I could get things made. And I've been really fortunate. Mm -hmm. Really fortunate. Yeah, sure. Now you're talking uh, mostly about feature films, right? How, how do you feel? Well, these are all so television movies. Sure. And then I've sold... I saw one series that the pilot shoots in October, mm -hmm. and I've also, I think, according to the meeting I was at, sold another series, but again, I don't count anything sold until I see the paperwork, and my reps have, have negotiated a deal. The series that I sold, mm -hmm. the negotiations were a month long. So tell me a little bit about that like well how can you walk away from a meeting and, and you're saying i think i sold it because the guy said we're gonna buy this mm -hmm. but again i don't believe anybody until they actually place a contract in my hand that i can sign sure. and have you had that experience where somebody said i'm going to buy it but then it fell through and, and what was that like? oh absolutely i've also had experiences where people have said i'm going to buy it and given me a contract i can't sign Okay. <laughs> because the deal's lousy. Okay. I mean, you know, you have to be, if you're going to be a screenwriter, you can't be a pushover either. You can't let producers say to you, this is the deal and this is you, take it or leave it. Um, in, in the case of that, when they say that to me and it's not a good deal, I'll say, I'll leave it. Okay. And the two times that I've left it, the producers both came back because they wanted the script. And said, okay, let's renegotiate. Let's do it. But they knew I would leave it. Sure, sure. Now, so, I mean, I think that's a good uh, lesson for, you know, like, let's just assume Let's just assume I have a script, and I walk in, and, and I really want to get this script made, right? Because it's my first, yep. it's my baby, my first yep. script. Oh, wow. You, you know, can't ever look at your script as your can, baby. Can I, can I pay you $25 to make my movie? Like, what, what is that like? What, how do you... How do you disassociate Well, desperate yourself writers that? will do desperate things, and, sure. and they always get burned. I mean, I can't think of a writer who, who made a deal like that with somebody who ended up being happy with it. Um, um, you want to deal with people who value you um, as a writer. Mm -hmm. And if you place your value to them as nothing, or as very low, or as scared, or as desperate, or mm -hmm. as subservient... Um, then, then that's the way they're going to treat you. Now, and, is that something you? Learned? I mean, to be honest with you, I'm going to give you an example. Sure. I had somebody said to me, "Well, I, I, I optioned my script to this company for free, mm -hmm. and they're going to pay me fifteen thousand dollars or something if they make it. Okay. But then they hired a guy to rewrite it. Now, are they going to pay him more than they paid me?" And I said, probably. He couldn't understand it. He didn't get it. He didn't. He couldn't understand how you could sell your script for fifteen thousand dollars. Then they would go hire a writer for fifty thousand dollars to rewrite it. Mm -hmm. And it happens all the time because you made a bad deal. Doesn't mean the guy who's going to rewrite it's going to make a bad deal. Gotcha. I mean, it's it's. God, it's hard to explain. Um, um, yes, if you, you need to, you need to be cooperative and fair. You can't, you can't ask for things you can't have. Uh -huh. You can't say, 
I want to direct if you've never directed anything. You can't say, first of all, you'd be surprised at how many actors will not take a part, even if they love it, with a director who has no track record. Sure. They don't want to look, end up looking bad. Right. So they won't, they'll just say no. Um, um, and then, and, and then direct, again, people who want to direct don't understand that. They think they just send the script out and everybody is happy, and it's not the way it works. There's so many working parts. Right. But also, um, you can't ask to act in it. You can't ask to be a producer. You can't, I mean, you can ask for those things, but it makes you look, so if, you, if it's your first script, it makes you look really bad. Okay. Makes you look unprofessional. Now, is this something you learned in your business world, like before you, you know, when you were doing the? Uh, I learned it. I learned it. Or did you have a mentor? In cases, in some cases, the hard way by by saying, you know, hey, I wouldn't mind a part in this, <laughs> and having them go, that's not how it works, and then learning really early on when, when with stuff that I optioned that didn't get made. Sure. And um, and just you know. As hard as it is to, to 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 realize this, but common sense really will really take you a long way in this business. Mm -hmm. Being smart enough to listen to that internal voice that says, I don't think you should do this, <laughs> is a really good thing. And when you have um, opportunities that come up, especially as a new writer... You have to look at those opportunities and see, you know, and know deep down that you have to, there's some times when you're going to have to say, I really want to get this made, um, and I will, I will make this kind of a sacrifice. But my kind of sacrifice and their kind of sacrifice might be different things. Sure. I will, I never wanted, or never wanted to write for free. Never. Mm -hmm. Because once you write for free, you've set your bottom line price. If somebody really wants your script, mm -hmm. they should be willing to invest something in it. I, it could be $500 for an option. It doesn't have to be a lot. Sure. But it has to be enough to tell you that they feel like you're worth something, or your script is worth something, or your talent's worth something. And then when they, and then when they, and then when they make the movie, you have to set yourself up as a, with a price that reflects two and a half percent of the budget, three percent of the budget, uh -huh. um, with a ceiling if it's a high budget movie, which you isn't going to be anymore, but sure. used to be that way. Right. And uh, and a bottom line that you'll that you'll accept. And these are things you need to negotiate. Everything's negotiable. I mean, there are, you can and and if they aren't, then you have to make a decision whether you want to walk away or not um, on the series contract. Um, I wasn't going to sign it because of one word, because of the, the lawyer and my manager both said that one word in there screws you. Mm. And then they said, well, we're not taking it out. And then I said, tell them I'm taking a hike. And, uh, two days later we got the contract back with the word out. Mm. Sure. You know, and you have to be willing to walk away. If they say, okay, then we're not going to do it, then you go, okay. And you're not any worse off than you were before. Right. You know, you're not, they're not, you're not going to be dead or your children aren't going to be taken away from you. And you're not going to be evicted from your home. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it, your, your life isn't any different. Mm -hmm. I mean, rejection is the, uh, is the, is the cornerstone of any screenwriter's life. <laughs> and, and, uh, and that's not just me, and that's not just anybody else. That's the big guys. Uh, how many, how many, how many scripts do you think those big, big writers have sitting in their offices that they wrote spec scripts that they'll never sell, mm -hmm. even though they're who they are? Yeah, sure. They have a lot of them. Yeah. I have a, I have a two foot tall. See that? See those scripts? Yep. Those are my specs. All the all the unsold, unproduced. Specs. Yep. Right for right now. Mm -hmm. That's where they are. Every time I write one, I put it on there, and every time I sell it, I take it out. Nice. Just <laughs> to remind me how many how many scripts I have that are unsold. Sure. So now you you had kind of a a little bit of a luxury of of you were able to take that time. 
uh, put, you know, you were looking to do features, correct? I was looking to do features, okay. but I've, I've discovered since that the feature business is going away. Sure. Uh, it's a, it's a relic of the past unless you're, um, you're writing something five million or less that will be in some of the independent theaters. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the mid-range thirty million dollar movie is. There's a couple of new production companies that say they're going to make thirty million dollar movies. We'll see. Okay. But um, but again, that's not very many, and and uh, and so you either have hundred million dollar movies and up, mm-hmm. or five million dollar movies and down, sure. and that's what they all are. Now the five million dollar movies can turn into ten million dollar movies. If George Clooney decides to do it, sure. Or if you know somebody else decides to, Denzel Washington wants right. to do it, then they go up. But you write a script that can be shot for five million or under, mm-hmm. and and nowadays if it goes to VOD or it goes to Netflix or if it goes to Amazon Prime or if it goes to all of them, mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. you can make your money back pretty pretty damn well. Mm-hmm. And what about like baby writers, you know, emerging writers? Uh, that maybe want to get into writing, but uh, what's your stance on like uh, shorts or? Uh, oh, if that? you want to write shorts and get them produced, I think that's a good practice. Mm-hmm. But I think if you want to, if you want to, if you want to do shorts, you might as well start being a director because shorts are really director reels. Nobody ever looks at the writing, okay. really, honestly. When was the last time you saw a short and went, "Ooh, that writing was great." Yeah, well, most of it is, like you said, the writer-director's pieces yeah. most of the time. So shorts are really for directors. You okay. can sell it. You can, you can give your shorts away, or, or somebody will say, I want $100 for your short when they're not a writer and they're a director, and that's fine. But if you think you're going to get noticed as a writer from a short, no, because people want to see the whole story. They don't want to see 10 minutes of, of, of writing. Right. Because, to be honest with you, somebody could be great writing 10 minutes, but... Are they great writing an hour and a half? Sure, no, that's a good point. Yeah, so, shorts aren't shorts aren't for writers. Shorts, and and I've had people tell me, "Oh, you're completely wrong." And that that you know, you know, you, a good backlog of shorts with your writing will get you noticed. And I haven't seen it, but but yeah. maybe it's happened to somebody. Sure, I mean, like with but, any rule, there's there are a couple exceptions. There are, there's all exceptions. There's sure. always exceptions, but, but you can't ever count on yourself being the exception because. That's a huge mistake. Right, right. Um, but I, I shorts are a great practice, and shorts are great. I've written two or three shorts. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I directed a short just to see if I could do it. How was that experience? It was great. It was really fun. I enjoyed every minute of it. I, you know what? Surprisingly, I enjoyed post production as much as I enjoyed production, mm-hmm. because getting the right music and the set and, the, and everything and all the you know, the working with an editor and getting it edited and all. It was really fun. I really enjoyed it. It's a good short. It's a really funny, kind of strange, silent film. Is that, uh, uh, you got it online somewhere? Interesting. And yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link. Good, good. But it's interesting for a writer mm-hmm. who, wants to, who, is, who is, doesn't really have that much interest in being a director, <laughs> just me, Sure. Uh, directing a film that was a silent film. There was the story. There was no dialogue. Right, right. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to do something that could show that I knew where to put a camera. And was that just something fun to do, or, or do you want to direct at some point? Or? I I don't know. I don't think so. It's it's you know it's a skill set that is amazing, and to be a good director, the skill set that you have to have. I I I meet I meet all these baby writers who say, well, I want to be a director, and I say, what have you directed? What do you know about? It? Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, and and they don't, and they think that directors just walk and say, "All right, now do this and do this," and they don't understand the incredible amount of work right. it takes to direct a film, sure, especially well. And so, um, I, I it, it, it amazes me that so no, I don't have the skill set to do it yet. I think the biggest um, thing that if people I wanted love- to. I, I, you know, I could probably, I think I'm too old. I, I'd rather just produce. It's sure. a, it's a much less, uh, it's, it's, there's much less things I have to learn. I think the uh, hardest thing for people to get used to is the amount of questions they're asked. 
you know, as a director. You're you're just bombarded with questions from everybody. Well, and all yes, the time. but not only that, and you have to have the answers to them. But right. not only that, but 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 these these young people who want to be directors don't understand what shot lists are. They don't understand what 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 you have to do. I mean, how you have to prep for what you're going to shoot. The, the, I mean, all the prep work. You know, for my short film, I had a binder that was like this. Mm -hmm. You know, like two inches thick of all the stuff that I wanted to do and shot lists and and all kinds of things that 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 I had to be prepared for so I could get this thing shot in four days because that's all I had the crew and the people for. And and uh, it's seven minutes long, but but it took four four days. Sure. So now in your writing, what what kind of themes do you like? Do you have like a, a theme that you like to explore? Nah. Like tell me a little bit about like your process. I, my, my pro <laughs> you don't want to hear my process because, because, because it's, it's antithetical to what most of the, of the screenwriting gurus say that you have to do. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, my process is, uh, I, uh, uh, somebody will say something that will make me think of something or I'll read an article that will make me think of something or I'll hear a conversation that'll make me think of something and I do the what if, what if this happened or what if this happened or what if something like this were to take place or what if somebody found this or did this and I'll start thinking about how I can put it I'll even I'll even get a title for for something mm -hmm. from an idea for a great title and I'll build a movie around that it just depends on wh where I am and so most of my stuff is what what people would call um, oh I don't know what is it what's that what's the term it's it's a high um, high concept mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Okay. Um, um, I don't do, you know, cop things. Or if I do a cop thing like I did with extracurricular, it's a weird cop thing. Yeah. You know, where, where the main character cop, the, the cop that's in it is, in a, is something different. Because he is. He's so much more involved than a traditional... Uh, yeah, he's, he's interwoven into that story and... Yeah. He's not an outsider looking in. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not. It's just, and it's not a cop story. Right, right. I would never say and that so, was a cop story. You're right. Yeah, but 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 um, it's the um, so my process is I come up with an, an idea for a film. What, what's what's going to be the the premise? Okay. Okay. And then I come up with what can I do for the first ten pages mm -hmm. that will absolutely rivet whoever's going to read it. What can I suck somebody in with mm -hmm. in the first ten pages? Sure. In extracurricular, the, it's the first page. It's the first page of the car right. on the hill. Yeah. Which, and these wonderful, these people who are, who are in the car and they're having fun and everything, and, and then it, by the end of the page, they're both dead. Right, right. And wait till you see how they cast that. They're, they're, it's like recognizable names. Oh, that's great! I can't wait. <laughs> so, so, they, I just oh, I just gave away a something of the movie. Um, but the point of it is, is the first ten pages I want to grab whoever's reading. It. Then I have an unending, I mean, an unchanging, unwavering. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, unassailable ending that okay. will not change. My ending is is I know where I want what I want it to end, how I want it to end. Okay. And I want it to end with something that's you know that reveals the end that is fun pages down path. And I have this ending that's never going to change. And then once I write that first ten pages and I know the ending, I take a trip with my characters. I let them lead me to where it's going to go. Sure. Now, and you, you generally think of the end, like, basically when you're thinking of this high concept premise, you're also imagining where it's going to go? Is that... Yes. Am I reading you right? I, I, I want it to end with this, and it's okay. not going to change, and I'm not going to change it. Sure. So that I have some place to go, that I have a goal mm -hmm. to hit. And then I just go, and I go, and I find characters I didn't even ever think of, I find things I never thought of in advance. I don't do any kind of, 
I let the characters lead me from scene to scene. Mm -hmm. So you read the story. You read a, you read about Mary Alice. Mm -hmm. Okay, she wasn't in my original idea at all. Right. I found her as I wrote the first draft. Okay. How many drafts do you have? Like a how many drafts you typically go through? Or, or extracurricular has been rewritten thirty five times, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, but but this is also from producers' notes and directors' sure. notes, and actors' notes, and all mm -hmm. kinds of things. But believe it or not. It's about 70% my first draft. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's and that's solid. really rare. Yeah, no, that's definitely pretty solid. I mean, you obviously had a, a good but story. But my, going my first drafts are very, very careful. I rewrite as I write. So if I find something three quarters of the way through that's going to change five things in the script, I'll go back and change those five things. And then keep going. But that's still part of the first draft process. Yeah, yeah. part of the first draft process. Yeah. I, I, it I takes should... me three or four months to write a first draft. Okay. And are you a write every day kind of guy? I try to be. You, yeah. yeah. That... I, no, I don't. I don't write on Sundays. I take Sunday off to be with my family. So, and sometimes I don't write on Saturdays, and I do take vacations. And yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm, I, I have, I have a lovely big office, as you can see. Mm -hmm. To my house, um, I got a I got a I got a, a treadmill and a sofa and mm -hmm. a barber chair and <laughs> all kinds of stuff in here for people to come sit and and I just I sit and I work in here and uh, um, my my wife is here and my dog is here my dog is here right now <laughs> and uh, and so I. Uh, I, come, I work in here, and, and if I can get five to pages a day, I'm happy. Nice. Now... Sometimes I can get 30, and sometimes I get two and throw them away the next day. Sure, sure. Now, Flex for, 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 for uh, baby, baby writers, what are, uh, what are some of the screenplays maybe they should look at that for you were inspiring, or you know, maybe your favorites? And, you know, something... Well, I mean, I have some favorites of... of, of of screenplays that I love, but I, my, my thing to writers is everybody's taste is different. I think you find you'll go back to your favorite movies to start with. Your favorite movies. And you get the screenplay for those movies and you read them and you read them and you dissect them and you take them apart and you figure out how they did what they did and how why it got sold. What was this, what was it that got people interested in it? Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about Marvel movies which are all pre-written. Sure. Um, with with you know with a the guys that write them do a great job, but all the bullet points for the movie are given to them by Marvel yeah, from the comic books themselves, yeah. yeah, or not even from the comic books, from whatever they've decided to do. It's different from the comic books, sure. and so um, so I'm not talking about Star Wars or anything like that. I'm talking about independent films that they or, or big films that they love. One of my favorite movies is L.A. Confidential, and I'm sure you heard that on another one of the, the podcasts that I did, because I talk about it a lot. Right. Um, I think that that script is as close to perfect as any script that there is out there. Mm -hmm. Back to the Future, another unbelievably great script. Uh, yeah. um, watch how they, their transitions and how they, how every little thing that they drop pays off someplace later. Mm -hmm. There's not any wasted space in that script. Right. Every little thing that you think is a throwaway pays off later. And that's helped me with my writing, because even in extracurricular, when I throw stuff out, somehow mm -hmm. it always comes back later. If, you, if, I, if I describe a piece of paper blowing in the wind, mm -hmm. then that piece of paper is going to come back later and have something on it. Right. Okay? Um, uh those kinds of scripts that, that are so airtight and solid. Those are those are the kinds of things that you want to read. You want to read. You want to read the things that that you like, and that and that resonate with you, and that you feel are are that you give you that wow factor when you watch them, and you read the original script and see how did they do this? How did they get this sold? How did, what was it about it that caught the eye? of whatever producer or director was involved. 
Hmm. And then understand you're never going to see the original version because it's been rewritten 68 times. Sure. And um, that's the other thing for baby writers that they need to know is that their script is going to get rewritten. And they can't fall in love with their script, and they can't be so in love with their script that they can't that they that they'll they'll go nuts if it gets rewritten because it's gonna get rewritten. If you want to write stuff that doesn't get rewritten, write a novel. Every script gets rewritten. Tarantino scripts get rewritten. Spielberg scripts get rewritten. Every script gets rewritten. Mm -hmm. Is that? Uh I mean, are you you're usually involved with the rewrites, or? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, I'm involved with the rewrites to a to a. I'm involved with the rewrites because I'm very cooperative and I'm, I understand how the how the system works. So yes, I'm involved with the rewrites. But have I have other writers been brought in on my stuff to rewrite? Absolutely, mm -hmm. it happens, and I just I have to live with it. I have to say, okay, fine, it's going to get made. My name's going to be on it. That's all I care about <laughs> at this point. I mean, I want it to be good, but you can't control that stuff. You can't, you can't help that stuff. Um, uh, it's going to happen. Sure. You know, directors want their say, and producers want their say, and you know, it's uh, the actors want their say, and stuff gets changed. And there's, you, you can either make a stink about it and, and not be involved at all. Or you can understand that that's the process for every movie. Be as cooperative as you can possibly be, so either you're involved with it through the whole process. You know, extracurricular or the other movie I I, I wrote called um, that I wrote um, called uh, Youth Group. Um, you know, under uh, in both processes, the the producers or the director have been calling me and telling me what's going on in casting when they're going to shoot, how things are going with locations. They don't do that with other writers, but they do with me because they know I understand what they're doing and I care what they're doing and I've been involved in being cooperative with what they're doing. It makes a huge difference. Huge difference. Yeah, I mean, I think it sounds like you've taken the uh, taken it to heart that this is a collaborative art form. You know, that no one stands alone and makes a movie. And, uh, no, we'll no. Nobody stands alone and makes a movie. There's too much money involved. There's too sure. much. There's too many people involved. Um, there's too much. There's too much going on, and there's so many moving parts that you're one of them, and and you're the one that gets dropped first, mm -hmm. because once they have your script and they're done with the rewrites that you're going to do, and they think that you can go no further with them, and they need another rewrite, they're going to go find somebody else. Sure. Oh, I, I think that's some great advice. I mean, uh, I'm the I'm, and also I'm the guy they find a lot of times. I mean, I've I've taken a lot of scripts and rewritten, and mm -hmm. I'm sure that the guys that wrote the scripts were very unhappy with me. I'm, I've taken it, it two times. I've taken scripts and only kept the premise and to, to do rewrites and rewrote them with a hundred percent different dialogue. The characters' motivations were all different. Everything was different, and yet, when they ended up being successes, there the other writer's names on it. So I'm going to wrap this up in a, in a minute here. But before we go, I was promised by you that you had a really great David Fincher story. I'm in Zodiac. I'm in Zodiac. I play a real life character. It was a cab driver who was a conspiracy theorist who thought he knew who the Zodiac Killer was. Mm -hmm. And he would keep coming back with his conspiracy. He would come back coming with his conspiracies. I was cut out of the theatrical version. I got a letter from Warner Brothers, a beautiful letter. I still have it. That says, hi, you're in the movie. We want you. Oh, there's my dog. <laughs> hey. Uh, He's excited about David Fincher. He's excited about the story. <laughs> you're, um, Anyway, Warner Brothers said I was. Um, I'm, you're in the movie, and um, um, come down to the premiere, and everybody thinks it's going to be happy. And then two weeks later, I got a call saying Warner Brothers made Fincher cut 18 minutes out of the movie, and you were part of the 18 minutes. Sure. <laughs> so you're no longer in the movie. And I thought, okay, I've been cut out of worse. Um, I've been cut out of some pretty good movies, but that was really disappointing. Though. 
Sure. And so when I got my first residual check, which was kind of big, I thought, wait a second, I'm not supposed to get a residual check because I was cut out of the movie. Mm-hmm. This is really strange. So I called my agent, my acting agent, and I said, I just got a check for Zodiac, and I know I'm not in the movie. And she said, uh, don't catch it, because somebody's going to catch it, they're going to want it back. And so I called somebody else, and I can't remember who it was. I called, oh, I called the union, and I said, I got this check, I think I have to send it back. And they said, well, let's check on it. And the union, the SAG, called me back and said, you know what? Your, that residual check is for the DVD that, that came, just came out, mm-hmm. and you're in the DVD. They put the 18 minutes back in for the DVD. Oh, nice. <laughs> so you're in the movie, but you weren't in it in the, when it went to the theaters, but you're in the, the, the DVD that's going to go everywhere. Sure. And that's what you're getting paid for. And I said, so I can cash the check. And they said, absolutely. Nice. And um, and I've gotten a few cents. I, you know, the last one I think was for forty two cents or something. <laughs> so I got I got cat I I auditioned for the game. Yeah, one of my favorite movies of all time. Well, you remember the 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 big fat private detective who he shoots the tires out of of his car? Yeah, yeah. The alley. Uh huh. I auditioned for that part, okay. and I got three auditions. I got back. I got when you're in SAG, if you make it to the third audition, you get paid for that audition, like twenty five bucks or whatever it is. But it's a paid audition, sure. And and so that's a big deal. And it was in a a, a ho- big hotel suite in San Francisco, and Fincher was there. He was there doing the audition. Of course, yeah. And I did my audition, and he goes, "Man, oh man, you know." You're just not fat enough. <laughs> and I said, really? He goes, yeah, but you did a great job, and I would love to have you do it. You're just not fat enough. Mm-hmm. And I thought, okay. So I don't do extra. I used to do, when I first started off as an actor, I did a lot of extra work. Sure. Lots of extra work. And, and um, I kind of stopped doing extra work when I started getting speaking parts and stuff. So I get a call from the extras casting agency for, for Zodiac, and they say, we need you to come be an extra in Zodiac. And I said, I don't want to be an extra in Zodiac. Thank you very much. And they said, no, we really need you to become an extra, be an extra in Zodiac um, and be um, drive a cab on, on set on the, for the scenes this day. And I said, I, I don't think I can do so they said, uh, 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 and then the head of the casting agency called me back and said, please do this. Honestly, please do this. I said, are you kidding? She goes, no, I just, please for me, please. And this is the head of the casting agency who calls you in to do principal work, to do, right. to get, to get principal roles, sure. not the casting part of her business. And I said, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. I told my wife, I'm going to do an extra job. And she said, ah, because, you know, extras on the totem pole on a film, even SAG extras, are like below the guy who waters the plants. Right, right. Okay? <laughs> yeah. They're the, they're the, they are at the bottom of the food chain. You're not even getting anybody so, coffee. No one wants to talk to you. <laughs> no, you, you don't even get, I mean, you just, you know, go, go sit in that room until we call you. Right. So, I go, I sign in, I do all these things, and then they're going to give out the different cabs to people mm-hmm. that are being cab drivers in the scene, or these scenes that they're filming in San Francisco. So I go, and this, and everybody is, the, the, all these guys are cab drivers, and I don't care. So I'm, I'm at the back of the line, and I'm wandering out to this parking lot where they have all these... 1960s cabs out there, mm-hmm. or 1980s, or whatever Zodiac was, right. 70s, 80s. And I walk out there, and one guy has already gotten in the cab, and is sitting, it's a it's a blue sunshine cab, I think, at the time, which doesn't exist anymore. 
And a PA said, are you Bob? And I said, yes. And he said, okay. And he walks me over to the Sunshine Cab where this guy's already sitting in and is gonna, that's going to be his cab for the mm-hmm. day because he's run, you know, because he's an extra and he's going to get seen. Right. And they said, get out of the cab. This is his cab. And I said, why? And they just said, just sit in this cab. So I said, okay. So I get in the cab and I do a couple of scenes. And then they're getting ready to do another scene and they say, not you. You're not in this scene. And I go, but they said all the cars. No, go take the cab and park it over there. So I took the cab and I parked it over there and I'm and I can remember exactly what was going on. There was a 49ers game going on at the time, and I had a radio with headphones. And I had the headphones on, and I'm listening to the 49ers game. And I'm half asleep, and I'm going, why am I here? I'm getting $114 to be an extra. Why am I here? And there's a knock on the window of the cab. And I look up, and it's somebody I don't know. And it's, it's uh, I think, the second AD or the first AD. And I roll down the window, and she goes, are you Bob Sines? And I said, yes, I am. She goes, okay, um, I drew the short straw, so I have to come over and talk to you. And I said, what are you talking about? She goes, David wanted you to be really nervous and really kind of thrown off because that's what the character was. Uh-huh. I said, what are you talking about? She goes, your scene is in about an hour and 15 minutes. You need to go to makeup and hair. <laughs> and I said, what scene? And he had remembered me from the game. Sure. <laughs> and when he got all the pictures and everything from the local casting people to audition, right. he saw my headshot and said, this is the guy for this. <laughs> And I said, what role? She drops the sides in the car and says, you're the cab driver. You need to learn these lines. You need to be... I said, what? (laughs) And so I go to makeup and hair, and I'm kind of... And they're they're cutting my hair way back. I mean, my hair's like this, but they're shaving the sides of my head, and they're giving me a like a 70s haircut. And I said, you know, my hair wasn't like this in the 70s. (laughs) <laughs> it was like that in the 70s and the and the makeup the hair and makeup woman said you weren't this old in the 70s <laughs> and so I got made up and they gave me this other, and, and I should have known because when I went for the they had me come like a week before to do a costume which is really weird for an extra yeah yeah definitely <laughs> but yeah, I was, thought other extras yeah. were going because it was a period piece right right and they had this thing laid out for me to have, wear and I thought okay this is fine. I it just my brain just didn't go that way because it doesn't go that way. Fincher had just worked this thing out that he was going to fuck with me, and and uh, and so I get out and then they said they sent this PA to get me to walk out to set, and they had moved the cab out into um, mission. Of the cr- crew were standing in a kind of a semicircle around it, mm-hmm. and Harris Savides who shot the movie. Uh, who the late Harris Savides, who's one of the greatest cinematographers that ever lived, operated a camera for my scene, which I thought was amazing. And uh, Mark Ruffalo was sitting in the back seat. Mm-hmm. And um, David Fincher walked up to me as I was walking out of the building to walk out to his cab and said, Hi, Bob. Put his arm around me and says, We're going to have some fun. <laughs> So we shot the scene, and he said, did you look at the dialogue? I said, yeah, I'm not sure I know it all yet. He goes, good, because I'm throwing it out. <laughs> I said, what? He goes, I just want to screw with you. Let's just, I'm going to throw you ideas through the window, and I want you to riff on them. And I went, okay. <laughs> and I did, and I spent a little over two hours in that cab with Ruffalo shooting these scenes. Mm-hmm. Just one scene. And yeah, the yeah. guy, and, and oh, the, this is the other thing he did to throw me off. He goes, by the way, it's based on a real person. And he, he was was really jittery and nervous. And are you feeling jittery and nervous? And I said, yes, you've done a really good job. <laughs> and, and he said, well, 
he was a chain smoker. Do you smoke? And I went, no, I don't smoke. And he threw me a pack of Marlboros and said, you do now. <laughs> so I got in the cab and there was a sound guy curled up on the floor of the cab in the mm-hmm. passenger seat with the boom. Sure. And, and I said, I'm going to drop ashes all over this guy if I do this. And Fincher goes, he's getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> and we shot it and the best thing that ever happened to me and I gotta tell you this, this is the end of the story so we finish and Fincher goes and they shot it with a Viper it was the first time they'd used the Viper camera Okay. and uh, I asked the VDs did you like the Viper and he goes I hate it I friggin hate it I love film and this is not film so he says do you want to go look at it to me because he's gonna just get the they were shooting they were yeah, had two guys that were putting it on discs at the time, you know, hard disc. Yeah. And he said, you want to go look at it? And I said, sure. And we walked back over to the Video Village area and sitting in one of the director's chairs watching the monitors was Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> and as I walked up, he looked at me and all he did, he didn't say anything, all he did was go gave me a thumbs up. <laughs> That's all he did. And I thought, you know what? I don't need anything else. So when I went and signed out that day in the trailer to sign out, and the, you know what the best part was? Because they'd hired me as an extra and then taken me and hired me as a day player, right. I got paid as both. Oh, right, right. <laughs> which was great. Yeah. I had 118 bucks that I got as an extra. It was like my bonus pay. Sure, sure. <laughs> and and uh, I went to the trailer to sign out, and they had the headshots of all the characters on the wall mm-hmm. in there. And it was Robert Downey and Gyllenhaal. And, I mean, there were hundreds of headshots on the wall. Right. All the, I don't know how many speaking roles there were in the movie. Maybe 60. Yeah. And, and all on the wall there. And the guy says, and if you think this was an accident, and he pointed to the wall, and there was my headshot on the wall. That's great. <laughs> That's my Fincher story. That's awesome. That's, a, that's just, <laughs> I mean, he's such a nut. <laughs> And you've I, heard I, stuff like this about him before. Oh, right? of course. Yeah, I mean, he shoots like 80 takes a scene. I mean, you, you hear oh, all no, these no, stories no, about this guy. Was, was, uh, he, shot, he shot a scene of Gyllenhaal running across the street. Um, uh, 72 times or something. <laughs> Gyllenhaal just, run, finally, just running across the street. Yeah, Gyllenhaal finally had it and said, no more. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but it, yeah, it was... Um, that's my David Fincher story. It was a it was a beautiful, wonderful thing. I mean, I've been great. really, really lucky. I, as, as far as being able to watch directors work, I've yeah. I've been in two Clint Eastwood movies, two Coppola movies, uh, one Ron Howard movie, and unfortunately, one Michael Bay movie. <laughs> well, he does what he does. He does well. Yes. <laughs> So you can. Uh, I have second cuts. He's the best. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much. I mean, I think that you know, wealth of information. I mean, you know, I've been thinking about that David Fincher story, waiting because you didn't tell me what it was, and no, I didn't. when we did our pre-interview. What you, so, and, what do you think? Oh, I think it's great. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go watch the game, and I'm going to rewatch Zodiac and uh, find your scene. <laughs> well, the game, uh, the game. I was really disappointed not to get that part because. They had given me, actually given me the entire script. And they couldn't find you with that script. I had the entire <laughs> script, and and he didn't have a bro- he didn't have a brother that did this to him. He had a sister that did it to him, mm-hmm. and they had told me that Jodie Foster was playing the sister. Oh, okay, wow. It wasn't it's Sean Penn, it, yeah. It, huh? It, it was, wasn't Sean Penn. Ended up being Sean Penn. And then yeah. when they shot it and did it, it was a guy, and it was Sean Penn. And, I mean, it was just. I mean, you. It was really fun being in on like the stuff that happened in this movie. And I love the game. I think it's an incredible movie. Oh, me too. And I was really, I was really bummed not to get the part, and I was really bummed not to get it because I wasn't fat enough. Well, that's what I'm saying. They couldn't find you a fat suit? <laughs> no, they don't. No, they can find a guy that's fat. They did. Yeah, they're, I know. <laughs> they found a good fat, really fat. That guy is at least 100 pounds. Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't feeling, well, I mean, he was That's probably the best reason to not get a job ever, right? You're what? not fat enough. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's, oh no! Listen, casting is so weird. You can yeah. get not get a job because you look like the director's cousin who he hates, right? Right. You know, right. And be the best person for the job. But 
It's well, just I got what. Well, listen, one more casting story you'll really okay. like. I walked into ca- to a movie to get cast. I walked into an audition for a movie, and I get in front of the camera and I say my name, and these guys start laughing. And I went, "Wait a second, I'm I'm trying not to be funny when I'm saying my name." <laughs> right. And they said, "I'm we're really sorry. When you finish your audition, we want to show you something." Okay. And I went, "Okay." So I do the audition, and I think I did a really good job. Uh, because when I audition, I don't care mm-hmm. whether I get the part or not. Sure. So it's kind of fun. Right, right. Um, because if I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. Mm-hmm. So I did it. And then I said, okay, guys, we're done. Turn off the cameras off. What's going on? And he says, come here for a second. And he pulls out the book with the, with the uh, uh, what are they called? The pictures. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the headshots. Uh, why can't I think of what they're called? Uh, where they have the... They have each shot like a cartoon. Mm-hmm. Oh, the animatics. Uh, they, uh, huh? The animatics? No, whatever they are. Yeah. Anyway, they showed me, they went to the, the, the scene where my character was in it, mm-hmm. and the, the cartoon drawing of the character looked exactly like me. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> I, was, I was just how they had pictured them, and I said, sure. so do I get the part? And the guy goes, hell yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, yes. And so it's because I looked like Right, some picture. random person's drawing yes. of this imaginary character. I got the part. <laughs> so you never know why you're going to get them. <laughs> That's great. Well, I can see why you get so many jobs. I mean, you're obviously uh, got a lot of charisma, and uh, your writing's pretty good, too. <laughs> but that's, that's what I care about. I mean, I, I, right. I, I want to... The whole point of all this stuff is that... Is that you, you have to be able to deliver, and that's mm-hmm. the baby writers need to know that, too. You have to be able to deliver something where, as they're reading it, they want to know what's going to happen on the next page. Right. And that's the secret. That's the only secret. Um, uh, all the rest of it is bull. Okay, all the books and all everything, you have sure. to write a great story. And there's so few out there that, that you can make yourself stand out by, by writing something they can't put down. Not easy to do, but that's what you have to strive for. That's great. So how can people find you if they're looking for you online? Ah, uh, let's see. I'm on Twitter at at B-O-B-S-N-Z, my last name without the vowels. Okay. Um, I'm on Facebook at me, Bob Signs, but mostly... A lot of my Facebook friends are, are my like high school friends. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it's it's more of a so my uh, Twitter is more of it, and I have a website. Um, well, I have a blog um, that does pretty well. I my problem is that I'm not you know I can do three blogs in a month or mm-hmm. no blogs in a month depending sure. on what's going on. <laughs> right. So I'm not real um, consistent. Huh? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not consistent at all, <laughs> and so. Um, they can read my blogs at uh, bobsigns.com slash blog. Right. And, uh, and they're, pretty, they're pretty good. And then they can email me at, email me at bob at bobsigns, S-A-E-N-Z.com. Nice. Well, great. Thanks again. And uh, I'm sure... Yeah, uh, I got my own domain name. I was able to get my own name, which was kind of cool. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, and let us know uh, when uh, extracurricular activity is... Uh, Extracurricular starts shooting in on June twenty first. Oh, okay. Well, I know basically who's been cast, but I'm not talking about it because I haven't been announced yet. But yippee! Yeah, no, that's exciting. Uh, no, 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 yippee! Because I have learned even since I talked to you last of some of the character actors that are filling out some of the smaller roles. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. You know. And and I am unbelievably happy. Just it's just going to be a cornucopia of recognizable faces, nope. which I am. Which, which production company with. is producing this? Um, it's a production company called Free Chicken Films. They they uh, it's a uh, it's a bunch of producers um, that have done a, bu- a lot of other films, and okay. they're just all came together for this one. Okay. Um, but one of the producers is a, one of the guys who does Wes Anderson's films, and and uh, another one has done a bunch of uh, great teen movies, and and uh, 
and you know, just they, I mean, just the guys that did it are just big time, big time guys. That wraps up my conversation with Bob Saints. I want to thank him for giving us a peek into what it takes to be a working screenwriter. A big lesson we can all learn from Bob's journey is that if you're going to look at filmmaking as a sustainable career, getting value for your work starts with you. Sure, sometimes it's in your best interest to work for free on small projects, but even then there should be some kind of value in your service. For instance, when I was looking to bolster my directing reel and get into working on web series, I collaborated with a producer who needed a director but had no budget to hire one. At the time, the experience and additional work to my reel was something I literally couldn't pay for because I didn't have the budget to produce my own material at the time. Directing and producing that series with the other producer became a form of payment because it allowed me to showcase my skills and make connections with cast and crew members that I would have never met if I didn't do the series. With screenwriting, you have to weigh what you have against who it's helping. As Bob explained, in general, writers do not make their name on short films. So if a producer or director asks you to give them your script so they can make a short film or web series with the promise of credit and furthering your career, the benefits are heavily favored on their side. If the project does get attention, then it will most likely be the director and producer who make a name for themselves, not the writer. This imbalance is one of the reasons that I suggest that anyone who's going to go the indie film route diversify their skills. Learning what goes into producing is a great way to not only get your work out there, but to make a name for yourself as someone who creates content. A great resource I discovered, thanks to the recommendation of producer Jenna Edwards, is the book The Complete Film Production Handbook. This book will walk you through the ins and outs of producing, and I'll leave a link to it in the show notes. The great thing about producing is that it's one of those positions that often benefit by having more than one producer on a project, so you don't always have to go it alone. The Indie Film NYC podcast is available on both iTunes and Stitcher. So if this podcast is interesting or useful to you, then please subscribe. And if you can give us a rating and review, that would be even better, because it will help more people find us and spread the word. And of course... Please check out the other blog posts and filmmaking information that's available on our growing website, IndieFilmNYC.com. Thanks for listening.